Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Board of NHS England. I extend a particular welcome to members of the public who have joined us um, in the room here in London this morning. And, of course, as everybody's aware, these meetings are also live-streamed, and that's a fundamental commitment by this Board from the very beginning to the principles of openness and transparency. We believe that the public of England have a right to see how and why decisions affecting the investments that we make in the NHS are, are made. So a warm welcome to everybody. I should stress that um, the meeting of the board this morning is a, a meeting of the board in public, uh, and um, as opposed to a public meeting, by the way. Uh, this is a, a business meeting of the board, uh, which is observed in public. But that we will also, at the end of this meeting, resolve to go into private session to deal with material uh, which, by virtue of its confidentiality or commercial sensitivity, uh, we're obliged to deal with in private. I should also say that um, the board meets formally in public, but um, also does quite a lot of its work through strategy meetings, informal discussions, a wide array of meetings with stakeholders, with patients groups and with others who have an acute interest in the work that we do. So that by the time uh, much of the business comes to the board, uh, there's been an elaborate process of strategic development uh, to try to crystallize the propositions that come to the board. And through much of that work, the board works as a unitary board. Uh, we have non-executive members and we have executive members, but in terms of strategic responsibility and indeed governance responsibility for the work of NHS England, this is a, a, a unified uh, unitary board. The formal issue that I need to raise with you now, please, two, two infor formal issues. One is there is no fire alarm scheduled for this morning, uh, so in the event uh, that an alarm goes off, our staff will uh, safely escort uh, you off the premises. And two, to ask you, please, everybody, if you could switch off uh, mobile phones so that there's no uh, interference with the proceedings. I'm now there going to declare the meeting uh, formally open. I'm going to invite any members of the board to uh, declare any interests that they have in matters on the agenda that uh, are not otherwise uh, registered. I have no declarations of interest. I wish formally to report one apology for absence, which is um, David Roberts, who unfortunately has an unavoidable uh, clash uh, of board responsibilities. Next, I'd like formally this morning to welcome Fiona Barr, sitting on my right, who is the new board secretary uh, responsible for the oversight of governance uh, across NHS England and for ensuring that the transaction of business uh, by the board is properly uh, and effectively organized. Next, to ask the board whether there are any requests for me to unstar the items of business in item 10. I've had no prior notification and I, I gather then we will take those as read. Uh, but I know, knowing my board well, that if anybody changes their mind during the meeting, uh, they will make that apparent to me. Okay. Let's then move on into the formal business of the meeting. Uh, we have the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, I have had no um, queries on them since we uh, first issued them. Can I take them as a, as a true and accurate record? Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have, as I understand it, um, no matters arising uh, that we should note, uh, but there are various actions that we know are underway. Let me then turn, please, to item three, which is the Chief Executive's report. Simon. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm going to be very brief because I will pick up each of the succeeding uh, board papers, and most of my report relates to those items, other than to say that uh, since we last met, uh, the uh, Chancellor has allocated additional funding for the NHS, as you know, and so one of our principal duties here today is to make decisions about how that money is allocated for the paper uh, before us later. Uh, very effective joint work has continued since the publication of the NHS five-year forward view with the other five national leadership bodies in the NHS, uh, CQC, Health Education England, Public Health England, Monitor, TDA, and when we come on to the discussion about the 
uh, planning guidance or year one of the forward view as we're starting it for next year, uh, we will have a chance to uh, reflect further on that. Uh, the government has also uh, now published the mandate for NHS England, which effectively sets the goals through the democratic process for the NHS for 2015-16, and as expected, that for the most part represents continuity with the objectives that the health service was being asked to pursue this year, with some uh, enhancements, uh, including on mental health services in the way that we'd previously advocated for. So when we come to that item, we'll have a chance to uh, reflect specifically on that. And then obviously at the same time as people are uh, planning for next year and beyond, there's also intense work across the National Health Service and local government to ensure that patients continue to get safe, high quality services through urgent and emergency care over this winter period. So Barbara will update the board on that specifically happy to take any other questions on matters not coming up uh, subsequently, otherwise we can uh, proceed. Anything for the Chief Executive at this stage? Just to say, I think the mandate ended up in a good place. Uh, I like the additions, but I like the continuity as well. Good, Great. thank you. Noted. Right. Um, we've got some um, very, um, I think, gritty items of business on the agenda today, so uh, let's move forward with the first of these, which is the planning guidance. I'd invite, um, Simon, did you want to say some further words about that before we call upon Ian to introduce the paper? So this will be the first time ever that the annual planning guidance for the National Health Service has been a shared enterprise of all of the national leadership bodies in the NHS. Uh, we aim to publish this on Friday and uh, our colleagues at TDA monitor, but the other bodies as well have been intimately involved with us together with the guiding coalition that brought together the forward view in shaping what this uh, will look like. And so this is not just um, business as usual, this is going to be uh, firing the starting gun on a number of the work streams that we identified in the forward view. And Ian is going to give more of a flavour of that. Uh, obviously we will have a chance with others to um, make final adjustments to this before publication on Friday. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a collaborative endeavour with the other five ALB partners and a wide range of other national stakeholders. Um, that partnership will extend not just to the production of the planning guidance but actually taking forward its contents during 1516 and the assurance of plans jointly um, by the um, arm's length bodies in what marks, we hope, a departure um, from previous practice. Um, the Two key themes of the planning guidance are progressing the uh, forward view in 1516, um, the first year, as Simon has alluded, um, and also integrating that with uh, a continued need for a forensic focus on operational performance and delivering the commitments within the mandate, uh, the continuation of those objectives which were set previously that the NHS needs to continue to deliver against, um, as well as then the one substantive change, which is the introduction of um, waiting times <laughs> standards for mental health services. In, uh, in, in running through the content very briefly of what that joint guidance uh, will look like, I would like to emphasize uh, just a few points. Um, the first is the importance that all of the arm's length bodies are placing on uh, what was chapter two of the forward view. Um, the need for NHS organisations to get serious about prevention, uh, working with our local government partners and voluntary sector partners on engaging communities and empowering patients and placing that right at the heart of planning requirements for 2015-16. Uh, the second uh, point I would like to pick up on content is um, around um, the progression of work on new models of care, where we are looking to work intensively with uh, Vanguard sites uh, to provide some support to help them get over the line as quickly as possible, as well as then work with uh, health economies uh, which face the greatest difficulties as part of a new success regime uh, to help uh, kickstart transformation in those areas. Uh, more widely, we are looking 
to have a more permissive regime for, uh, for the, the rest of the country, including uh, an invitation um, uh, that uh, local economies working in a collaborative way could bring in national partners uh, to offer insight um, and value to the local plans that they are constructing. Uh, I would then, the final point I'd like to pick up on is in relation to delivering improved outcomes and in particular patient safety and I think it's noteworthy that we will be introducing in 2015-16 um, a new national sequin indicator uh, for tackling sepsis um, and also a new national indicator uh, for tackling acute kidney illness and we will be able to do that through the planned retiring of the existing safety thermometer indicator and the friends and family test indicator uh, in relation to hospital services, both of which will find um, themselves in the new stand, um, in revisions to the standard NHS contract. summary. Let me invite um, comments questions from the board. Victor. Uh, I've got the right version. I can congratulate you on, <laughs> on the fact that you have mentioned NHS citizens. <laughs> there are three things actually I want to say. The first is that um, the NHS citizens uh, point that's made in the engaging communities is significant, a significant shift I think in the way we do things around here. I think that we're going to have to work really hard to get the get the skills and the organisational design right to ensure that NHS citizens' impacts on areas like commissioning. And I think it will come up again in the course of this meeting. The second thing is, I think um, you it's, it's in the report, but it's in the guidance, but it's kind of skated over, which is the race equality standard. I know that uh, it will be seen as a minor intervention. I think it's a significant patient safety intervention. And um, the, if I have a question, it will be about how do we ensure that it's a system-wide um, uh, intervention that has the system-wide leadership across it, which you talked about in the opener. And the third point is, is more, uh, uh, you, the voluntary sector is noted, is mentioned, I think, in this version, um, in related to grants and, and grant agreements. I think I would, I would want to uh, comment on the role of the voluntary sector beyond the grant agreement. I mean, I <laughs> declare my interest in that um, the voluntary sector is a significant provider of some services um, which are contracted to the NHS. And there's a question about how the not-for-profit sector, voluntary sector, call it what you like, actually engages in the health and social care market at the moment beyond the grant arrangements. So it, it's just a in a sense, it doesn't go far enough. It's welcome that it's there, but I think there are issues about the marketplace and not-for-profit providers that go beyond just the arrangement of grants. Would you like to respond? You don't have to. It's just so I think your first point on NHS Citizen um, uh, is, is extremely well made. As you say, it will need, we will need to embed um, uh, public uh, engagement, engagement of communities as an integral part of commissioning. Um, your second point on the introduction of a new workforce rates equality standard and this follows uh, discussion consideration by, by the National Equality and Diversity Council earlier in the year is as you say a very significant intervention um, not just for staff um, but we hope for users of services as we end up with the leadership of NHS organizations better reflecting the communities that they serve. Uh, we are very much uh, planning to work in NHS England with the constituent members of the EDC. Indeed, I wrote out to EDC members um, last week um, inviting um, their contributions as part of a, a broad-based coalition to try and drive action in this area. Um, and then um, thirdly, again, I would agree wholeheartedly with your observation around the importance um, of the new arrangements that we're planning for, uh, for grants, which are simpler than going through uh, the bureaucracy of the national standard contract and the need for us to supplement that with both the invitation for voluntary sector leadership of many of the aspects of the forward view work and indeed thinking not just about their leadership um, uh, nationally, 
uh, in relation to policy and strategy and program design, but their role as a contributor uh, uh, delivering services to communities. No. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Um, given that one of the central planks of the five-year forward view is to consider and introduce new models of care, um, what's your feeling, Ian, about pace and urgency with which we can capitalise on the groundswell generated and the support generated in the five-year forward view for new models of care? and also capitalise on the Dalton Review, I think, which was around new organisational constructs, which came out a week or so ago. And how can we, how can we get, inject that urgency into the system, Ian? Um, so I, I think, uh, again, you make a very, very good point around the level of um, enthusiasm um, that has been generated by the Ford View. Uh, the different conversations that are happening uh, within individual organizations, but also potentially more critically across local health economies as, um, as communities are beginning to think through, well, actually, what might the forward view mean um, for them? Um, I think our challenge in the planning guidance and then the subsequent rapid mobilization of national resource across multiple agencies will be able to provide a compelling offer of support to vanguard sites uh, across the country um, to help unblock some of the barriers to change that people are experiencing, whether this is information governance, challenges around navigating procurement rules, understanding constraints around the workforce, um, a desire to uh, develop new contractual and payment mechanisms. Um, we have, I think, a major program of work that we will be constructing very early on in the new year to help address those issues. And we will need to co-produce that um, with our arm's length body partners, with our wider coalition of other national partners, and above all, jointly with the local sites um, who are experiencing these difficulties. Very good. Thank you. Tim. Um, thanks, Malcolm. <clears throat> I just wanted to bring to the board's attention a theme which emerges in, the, in this planning guidance, which I think will come to be regarded as one of the most important step changes we we are engaged in in relation to modernising services, and that that is the focus it has on really forcing the pace of adoption of core digital standards in in our provider services. And this is really just to, for people to, the first time that there has been a consensus right across the system, the health and care system, that we now need to bring real, uh, real focus to delivery of a safe, uh, sustainable digital service, not, not just in relation to the um, improvement of of uh, delivery of services, but also to put patients much more fundamentally in control of what they do. So, for example, the planning guidance notes and and encourages um, the adoption during the course of 15-16 of uh, people's access to their own data in primary care and elsewhere. But I just wanted to bring to people's attention that, because I think it, in many ways it underpins much of what the forward view um, aspires to deliver, but also is, I think, a very important step forward in relation to uh, to driving change in the in the NHS. And I just wanted to um, underline really the point that um, Simon made about the continuing collaboration that this represents. It's incredibly important um, that people don't design the future collaboratively and then go off and do their own different things, giving um, different messages to the uh, wider sector. Um, so I, I know it won't be easy for um, uh, Simon and his colleagues in NHS England, but also for those other bodies. So I think it's important that we recognise and support and, and recognise the centrality of that. If it isn't done, if this difficult job isn't done collaboratively, it really won't get done. The minimal expectation that the service has of us actually is that the leading arms length body should work together. I mean, it's not it's not straightforward because we each have different responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, different focuses in different parts of the service. But um, I think one of the bedeviling characteristics of past history is different messages coming from different arms length bodies and from the government. And if we can be united about this, I think that's a fundamental precondition to the forward view actually working, Kieran. Uh, 
I agree with all of that, by the way. Um, my, my worry is change capability on the ground. The system is running around faster than ever, demand higher than ever, and uh, people growing up in a culture which, you know, the boundaries of their role and their institution have been fairly well defined. Um, apart from a great document and exhortation, what specifically are we going to do to make sure that there's change capability out there and collaboration can happen you know, in each of the health economies that we're, we're talking about? Because we can hope for it, um, but that won't actually work. So I think that you highlighted there, Karen, a, a profound challenge um, that we collectively face here. Um, I'm confident that uh, working with our partners we can develop uh, a national support program which can particularly help the Vanguard sites um, and some of the uh, economies where we will need to take a more directive approach. Um, uh, we have the reviews um, of some of the national support arrangements, um, so IQ, Leadership Academy, Academic Health Science Networks um, and so on. Um, which will need to be aligned with this agenda and I think that will potentially provide part of the answer. Um, part of the answer as well I think will be the, um, the way in which different existing organisations um, decide to collaborate and use networked approaches. So Noel, you raised the point around the Dalton Review. Some of the recommendations of the Dalton Review are around uh, the development of management chains and franchises, whether that's tertiary chains such as the Miles Donat or the Christie at, um, or whole organizational chains. And I think there will certainly be scope for organizations to build additional capability for change management through more formal um, or informal partnership approaches across different organizations. Um, but I think we need to recognize that uh, a profound change in the delivery of models of care that reflects, picking up on Tim's point, the transformative potential of technology as well as redesigning workforce roles, um, the offer of care to individuals that breaks down barriers between formal caregiving and the role of communities and their families, as well as then a set of major technical enablers and organizational design challenges, um, is a profound long-term program for change. So whilst I hope we can make rapid progress um, in demonstrating success, and demonstrating success with um, sites that aren't just solving their own problems but actually serving as replicable prototypes for others and the subsequent wave of early adopters. We need to be realistic about the pace of whole system transformation and the amount of investment that will be required to deliver that uh, consistently across the NHS. Whilst being not top-down and directive, and whilst exactly. developing local leadership and capacity. Exactly so, Chair. Ed. So, um, we can say all that, um, and, and, and we have to say all that, and, and the challenge is the complexity of it. I mean, I think we are so massively supportive of the guiding coalition that's been uh, created, and, and of course accountability and structures that are separate is important, but the, the further we go with this, the more porosity of boundaries uh, is necessary uh, and it's not going to be just reviews of bodies that fix it it's going to be how people operate at all levels on the ground day in day out how they relate to one another how they respect each other how they focus on the outcomes of of the work that they're doing together um, and this is a monumental behavioral change uh, which does not start in the center uh, but signals can be sent through all uh, a, a variety of things underpinned by enablers around data. So Simon, I mean, I, I think the question is at the top level the guiding coalition um, is is there um, and there's sort of there emotionally and intellectually. Uh, how do we accelerate the um, the creation of that guiding coalition at every level in the organisation such that when we come through to this planning guidance which is about to be live uh, we get a shift in the way in which things come together and, and get done. 
Yeah. Well, in terms of the statutory agencies, the six statutory agencies, obviously, as you say, Ed, there's the national piece. The regional uh, groupings are coming together in a much more coherent way than has been the case before. Obviously, NHS England has more folks regionally than does TDA, and TDA has more than Monitor. So there is a sort of sense of shared endeavour there. Locally, obviously, what we're going to be doing through the process that Ian just described in terms of asking those parts of the country that think they are kind of on the cusp of doing something really dramatic and exciting is then applying a series of tests and supports. And part of that is show us that you are working collectively, show us that you are mobilising and engaging more broadly than just the health service, uh, not also just the health service political government, but actually making a reality of the notion that we've got to mobilise community groups, faith groups, uh, the voluntary sector, patients, organisations and others across your community for the direction that you want to chart. For the second group, however, those that are kind of in uh, sustained structural, operational, financial problems, uh, people in a way, for different reasons, know they need to change. They know, I mean, what's remarkable is when you look at these places, I mean, it's the same places in many cases that for, you know, 5, 10, 15 years have had these deep-seated problems. And so that's why I think people are willing to now say, all right, as I sort of said before, since we can't solve the exam question as opposed to us asking a different set of exam questions, and let's just put more stuff into contention. And part of what they've got to put in contention is what you've just described. So I think there is a willingness at both ends of the spectrum, uh, even if it's motivated by different sets of reasons. And since we can't work collectively with everybody, uh, we'd be spreading ourselves very thin. That's why we've made the kind of decisions to do those who need it most for the new successful regime and those who are nearest to pulling it off to back them as they do it. If I can add just very briefly, I, I think this will call for a different scale of engagement between uh, national organisations and their regional um, outposts um, than has hitherto been the case. And again, a different intensity of communications with the NHS. One thing I think we would, as a board would seek assurance on is what is our capacity to actually do this, um, given the resources that we've got? Well, so I think the point, Malcolm, is we don't have the capacity and nor do, does the sort of NHS national bodies collectively to do this everywhere all at once. So that's why we're basically cutting our cloth accordingly and saying, look, there are these two groups of communities that we think we can intensively work with beginning next year, supported, frankly, by the 450 million of transformation funds that we've been able to secure from the government, which gives us a fighting chance, which when we last met, we did not have under our belt. But we have got the capacity um, to, to concentrate on those two groups to the extent that we would wish. Yes. Okay. Margaret. A couple of points. Um, first of all, um, it's very clear that we'll be learning as we go along, and I think that what we need um, to ensure that the learning isn't lost is um, to ensure that there's, I suppose if you like, structured advocacy from the van those at the vanguard. Uh, I'd very much like to see that we're using those at the vanguard to help shore up the messaging and the learning. Um, and the, the other really important point, well, no, sorry, the three points, actually. So the second point um, is that, um, as Ed quite rightly said, um, we're going to need to make sure that the workforce is sufficiently flexible. Um, and that's quite an ask. So leadership supporting workforce to make the changes is going to be absolutely critical um, because that, that the flexibility that, that, that's required is almost, um, in some cases, it will be counterintuitive because it's new, it's novel. So one needs to, to be very supportive of, of those facing change. Um, and then the last point is, is um, it goes back again to, to a point that Ed made about um, the potential for porosity in the system. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that the, the word alignment appears so often in, 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 in this, the guidance um, at the top. What's going to be critical here is alignment in assurance processes as well. And um, so that when we are seeking assurance, those ent enterprises that are um, seeking assurance are not actually asking for separate um, 
aspects of insur insurance that will create a burden um, because otherwise people with working within the system will become weighed down by it. So where we are integrated, we should be integrated in the way we seek assurance back and that should be far more structured. So I think this is an interesting uh, avenue of inquiry we should come back to actually at our, uh, if not in the next meeting, the meeting after because obviously that will be the point at which particularly the TDA monitor and ourselves will be uh, taking a look at what is being planned locally and having to make those kind of judgments. I think the reality is that you know, TDA will have continue to have a specific set of expectations of the providers for which they have responsibility that don't contradict but are separate from the um, oversight that we need of the plans coming out of CCGs. Where I think it gets more tricky is where you have divergent expectations in the local Absolutely. health community. And frankly, some divergence um, may be entirely legitimate, but at the very least, uh, I think what we want to see is uh, converged plan Bs. So, you know, if one group thinks that the answer is, uh, our, our intention is to do this for the year, uh, and that's different than what some other uh, players are doing, I mean, that could be okay, but if reality doesn't turn out in the way that uh, one group thinks, mm. then what is their, uh, what's mm. the plan B to ensure yes. that it all works? And this particularly yes. will show up in the context of the Better Care Fund assumptions around emergency admissions next year, for example. So I think we'll need to come back to this conversation uh, in the new year. And on your first point of, of um, structured advocacy, we will certainly be looking to build that into the expectations um, of those Vanguard sites, that they will have a role to play not just in proving concepts um, locally, but they will then be able to support the subsequent waves of um, uh, early adopters. Mm. Thank you. Bruce. Mm. Thank you. Much of the discussion has revolved around how the planning guidance is um, is in many ways a response to what people have asked for. And that's also true in the clinical arena, which, um, which Ian alluded to. So clinical colleagues in the NHS are always looking for ways to improve services. And of course, one of our jobs is to, is to help them do that. And as a consequence of that, we've kind of focused our, um, our endeavor around outcomes trying to improve outcomes in the NHS. And we do that in five areas. The first is we ask ourselves, what are we doing to help um, improve premature death? What are we doing to help people with chronic and long-term disease do to look up to, um, to have a better experience of that? What are we doing to ensure that uh, people who require short episodes of care are getting uh, better outcomes? How are we ensuring that patients have a better experience of that care? And, and importantly, what are we doing in terms of ensuring that the way we deliver our services is safe? And against those kind of five areas which we assess ourselves, um, we've engaged with clinicians in the NHS to say, where do you think we can have some really, really big gains? So uh, we've consulted with medical and nursing directors, royal colleges, specialist associations, the sepsis trust, the ombudsman and others. And what has emerged out of that discussion has been that we think two areas where we can make significant improvement are treating people with sepsis, and I'll describe what that is in a moment, and treat people who have uh, pro problems with emerging kidney disease. And sepsis is where germs get into the blood, and if they multiply in the blood, people become really very, very sick. It has an impact on um, many of their body organs, including their kidneys, and they can deteriorate quite rapidly and die. Now, that death in many cases can be avoidable if people are alert to the symptom, symptoms of sepsis and then give the appropriate antibiotics very quickly. And this is a problem which is being tackled around the world at the moment with enthusiasm, and we intend to do uh, exactly the same. So that's the, the aim of uh, what's outlined in, in the planning guidance and indeed the, we have support around the system for this and indeed the Secretary of State will be putting more flesh on the bones on this later in the week. Victor. Um, which is that this is uh, a significant challenge to the signals we send out into the system about what, how we measure what's important which are going to shift. So 
you know, system changes like this, that, that, that you start with some fantastic ideas, I mean, really powerful notions of what we should be doing and how we should be doing it, and then are killed because business as usual um, basically just sends out the same signals through the information that we ask for, the bureaucracy, the systems, all that. And I, I'm just interested, I'm not looking for a response now, I'm just interested in, in how, in how what we're saying in, in, the, in the planning guidance and in the forward view, in the forward view planning guidance, I know it all links, actually will shift how we and what we measure um, that gives this board and others line of sight to what is actually happening on the ground. I mean, there's been a number of allu that, uh, no, allusions to it, but I think it's quite a significant signal into the system because, you know, the, my view is that it, the NHS has got used to episodic change and so people survive the change because they know there'll be another one coming along. This is very different. This is about a con move to a continuous change process. And the question, it's just, it is just a question, is how do we then ch change one of the significant signals into the system, which is what it is that we measure, how we measure it, how do we co-create um, an outcomes framework that it makes sense, not just to us, but to the people who actually deliver the front end, um, and the citizens, and I think that's a significant challenge which we haven't really got our heads round yet. But I think we, I think we will need to fairly fairly quickly because the danger of saying saying one thing and doing another is frankly more dangerous than doing nothing at all. Ian, would you care to respond to that? You don't. I mean, yes. I'm not looking for a. Re I'm just no, yes, unless you disagree hugely with what I've just said. Absolutely, I'm and I, I think the, to your point about how do you translate a. Uh, a hugely ambitious vision into the actual conversations and behaviours of individuals at all levels in the system um, that are fully aligned with the scale of that ambition and that method and spirit. I I just, sorry, I just want to, I want to stop you. I'm moving beyond the conversation to the measures because I know we'll have the conversations the risk is that what will then happen is business as usual in terms of what we measure. That's what I was referring to. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the actual what we measure, the infrastructure that surrounds yeah. that that I'm talking about, rather than the com the conversations. Yeah. The, the, just so yeah. that we don't go off at the wrong. Yes. <laughs> and there's, I think, there's a profound challenge which the planning guidance tries to address, which is to say that we still have a set of very clear obligations to the people of England in relation to delivering existing core performance mm. standards set out in the NHS constitution as well as a need to make progress against the five outcome framework domains that Bruce has alluded to through a process of transformation including um, developing new models of care and the, I think the message that we will be looking to set out in the planning guidance is that neither of those two aspects, mm. the operational performance against the existing metrics, nor what we need to do to ensure that we have a better and sustainable NHS for the long term, neither of those two are optional. Mm. And that we will need to continue to make um, good progress on both of those during 2015-16. And that is a major challenge to the service, but I think it's the reality of where we are. Right, well I think it might be the appropriate time at which to draw this item to a close, but um, to conclude I think in the following terms. The first is that, um, I, as I understand it, the board approved the principles and the style of approach and the concentration on uh, underpinning excellence and reinforcing uh, the more challenged uh, systems, whilst not um, in any way relaxing its expectation on performance across the, the system as a whole. Uh, I think secondly, uh, the board would wish to see the five-year forward view as a significant item in all items of coming of business coming to the board in the future. It's not a sort of standalone thing that's bolted to the side of what we do. It's it's core part of of, of everything that we take through. Thirdly, uh, I think we want to be able to measure uh, what, what what is occurring, to have good sight of good line of sight to what's occurring, uh, and to ensure that the collaboration, uh, coordination and partnership that we've established with the other arms link bodies remains absolutely rock solid uh, and to do what we can on that.
Um, I think we want to be assured always that we have the resources and the capacity to deliver uh, what we're promising uh, to deliver as an organization. And um, I think finally we are willing under those circumstances to uh, delegate to the chief executive and the executive team uh, the final uh, wording of the guidance, uh, which has, of course, to be coordinated with our other, um, uh, other, other partners. Can you just tell us what, what is the timing that you anticipate for publication? Uh, we are aiming for this Friday. Okay. So um, there is... Um, what we have today is a summary. There's more detailed guidance, which will be finally attuned with our partners and published on Friday. Is the board content to proceed on that basis? We are. Good. Thank you very much.